around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. This is Pastor David Lankford. As always, we would like to welcome you today to this edition of the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's Monday, January the 15th. It is my prayer, my heart's desire that you were blessed immensely over the Christmas days. Uh, I know some don't celebrate Christmas. That's perfectly all right. Christ was not born in December the 25th. Christ was born either in September or October in the fall of the year. Won't get into the numbers there uh, relative to his birth, beginning his ministry at about the age of 30. But just want to say thank you as well to each of you who sent us a card. Those of you who uh, sent a card and blessed my wife and I for our 36th wedding anniversary on uh, December the 12th. But we are so grateful, so thankful for everything that you have done for the ministry here at The Voice of Evangelism. We never take you for granted. We know it is by your love, your goodness, and helping the ministry that we are here today by the grace of God. Without your help, without your love, without your genuine affection, The Voice of Evangelism would be nothing. But we are a body. We are a body corporately. We function together. Some are eyes, some are ears, some are the smelling. Some are the feet, some are the hands. We're a body. <clears throat> That's why I marvel at people who say, the church is the bride of Christ. Well, will somebody please tell me who the body of Christ is? Can't be both. Can't be both. If you don't have my latest book, uh, New Jerusalem, Bride and the Mystery of the Church, uh, not because I wrote it, but you are missing a plethora of insight as well as information. Last week, we were talking about fasting. We're going to pick that back up today. Uh, we began the fast yesterday, January the 14th, Sunday. We always begin our fast on Sundays. I'm asking those of you that will to fast with us as you feel led by the Holy Ghost. I never expect lay people to do what I do. They that measure themselves and compare themselves among themselves are not wise. So I never expect lay people to do what I do as a minister. My life is devoted wholly to Christ. Uh, I do not work a, a, a job. Uh, my job is ministry. Uh, from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed, I work in the ministry, whether it's Bible study, preparing messages, researching, answering mail, returning phone calls, it is a 24-hour job, basically. Uh, we get called at night. Somebody called me the other morning at 3 a.m. and woke me up. We had forwarded the phones uh, from the office to the home. And, of course, it was somebody on a tirade. And like an idiot, I answered the phone. But we do that because we never know who might call and what the situation might be. We're going to be picking up the subject again of fasting. I don't know whether I'll conclude it today or conclude it tomorrow, just depending on how the Spirit of God leads and the program today. Fasting. Fasting is one of the greatest New Testament channels of power that God has given to men and women. And without a doubt, I know I know without a doubt this is the least used and sought after method when it comes to spiritual things. People do not want to fast. I said people do not want to fast. I've had so many people tell me, Pastor, you're going to hurt yourself with all these extended and long fasts. I'll be 63 years of age next month. My blood pressure is 120 over 78. I keep a measure of life insurance on me for my wife 
that in the event something happened to me, she would not struggle. I got preferred plus. That's right. Preferred plus on my evaluation when they drew the blood, etc. I had my blood panel some two or three years ago done by a personal physician, a mutual friend of mine, and I, Steve Quayle, Dr. Neil Spate. My blood panel is the blood panel of a 30-year-old man. That comes from my physician. Why do I say that? Because you're not going to hurt yourself fasting. Oh, I, I know some of you, when you start, you're going to have dizziness. You're going to have headaches. You're going to have sugar, caffeine withdrawal. You're going to have all sorts of feelings that you've never experienced before. But I assure you, you're not going to hurt yourself. As a matter of fact, fasting will heal your body. Isaiah 58 and 8, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rear ward. This is the fast I have chosen. Isaiah 58, verse 6, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Fasting. Many of you, I can say this in a spirit of certitude. If you were to fast, God has put the elements in your blood system to naturally heal your body. Some of you, if you would fast, your diabetes would be healed. Your blood pressure would be healed. I've read every book just about that I've ever been able to find and put my hands on concerning fasting. Fasting burns the toxic poisons within your body. I look at the brain, and this is my evaluation from a ministerial viewpoint. I'm not a doctor by no means. But I look as the brain has a type of varnish with all the sludge and all the byproducts in food. And it puts a coating on the receptors of the brain. They're not able to fire neurologically as pristine and be as keen as they would be because of the sludge that's in the blood system. You see, all oxygen, all minerals, all supplies are carried to the organs of the body by this red substance called blood. When you fast, your blood naturally begins to thin. Why? Because it is not then carrying minerals and supplies to the organs of the body. And when the blood begins to thin, it can go into the deeper portions of the organs and tissue of the body. Don't discount what I'm saying because I am speaking from empirical knowledge. Uh, The last 10 years, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, uh, my wife and I have fasted 21 days every January. People say, well, you, you should tell that. It should be between you and God. I tell you that to let you know there is power which brings an anointing and a greater sensitivity to the Holy Ghost and understanding the Word of God. As I said previously, there are all types of fast. The length, the time, the duration, the type of fast is based solely upon the need or just 
how hungry one becomes for Jehovah for him to grant us a answer to prayer or to give us a revelation or whatever the case might be. But the Bible is replete both in Old and New Testaments where great men and great women of God fasted and prayed and sought God's face. Esther, what a great woman. She neither ate nor drank for three days. That, my friend, is the hardest fast I've ever done. Say what? That's right. I have fasted 40 days. I have fasted 25 days, 21 days, 14 days, 7 days, 10 days, 5 days, 3 days. I have fasted. I've done all sorts of fast. Once I did the Esther fast. Notice what I said. She neither ate nor drank for three days. By the third day of my fast, before the third day was completed, I was so dehydrated, it was in the winter time, and I choose the winter time because you can't get outside and do much, so it's just a time of being sequestered and uh, being secluded with God. But I became so dehydrated, I drank, I remember drinking about a quarter of a cup of water. I, I, I was just so, uh, we used the term cotton mouth, my mouth was so dry. And it broke my heart because I couldn't finish three days. That's why when you read in the scriptures, except one person, and I'm going to share that with you today, they all drank. It doesn't say anything about Jesus afterward thirst. He says he afterward hungered. Because if you don't get water in your system to help flush out the impurities, you become toxic. You become toxic in your body. And so the water is the method of getting those toxic poisons out, and that's the fuel that the body is expending to create energy for you to continue to function during your fast. I, I pray you're taking to heart what I am saying today. I'm saying this because I want you to understand there is power in fasting. Matthew 17, 21, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. God has already put it within your immune system to heal your body, but your body is overloaded with toxic poisons, and you're grappling, you're struggling to heal your body. I read books where doctors have brought people into their institutions, blind, deaf, put them on a fast. In a matter of weeks, they put an IV, they fed them through an IV. But in a matter of weeks, their hearing returned. Their eyesight came back. Your body is a type of machine. What you in ingest is what's going to run your body. And so it it it's up to the believer's choice course we're all going to die you can't put off dying but i believe you can help negate the severity of the physical aberrations and the physical anomalies that will beset you in your clay jar if you do not take care of your body your body is the temple of the lord now i said a moment ago there's only one man that we have record of in the scriptures who neither ate nor drank, not only for 40 days, but for 80 days. Some theologians go as far to say 120 days, but I do not embrace that theology. I do believe Moses went back to back, 40 day fast, a total of 80 days. He neither ate nor drank. A human being would die. And the natural. But God sustained Moses with his presence. God sustained Moses with his presence. God's presence in Moses' life was his sustenance. Was his sustenance. Jesus said in John 6, 35, I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. Job, I, I, this, is a, this is a powerful, powerful statement that Job made because he understood 
God's word. Job 23, 12, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. More than my necessary food. Jesus told the devil, In, four, in, in Matthew chapter 4, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said to the devil. Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee. And suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Jesus quoted that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, as well as in Luke chapter 4, verse 4. Your sustenance spiritually is always that of Christ. The reason Moses was able to be sustained, God was infusing in his body divine supplement and sustenance for him to live. Now, I want you to look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 9, beginning at verse 6. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt until you came unto this place, ye have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb ye provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tablets of stone, even the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. So, Moses is sharing with us his encounter with God and how that God sustained him, even though Moses does not directly address that fact other than he neither ate bread nor drank water for 40 days and for 40 nights. There's your first 40 days. Now let's look at the second 40 days. Deuteronomy chapter 9, beginning at verse 24. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights as I fell down at the first. This is a divine reoccurrence. This is a divine reissuance. God is reissuing to the man of God, Moses, a second set of the Ten Commandments. Thus I fell down before the Lord forty days and forty nights, as I fell at the first, because the Lord had said he would destroy you. And I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of, the, out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to the wickedness, nor to their sin. Now, as I said a moment ago, this is a reiteration, 
a reissuance of the Ten Commandments. Now, I said there were some theologians who go as far as to say that Moses fasted 120 days or there was a third set of 40 days. And where do we get that? We get that from Deuteronomy chapter 10, beginning at verse 8. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless in his name unto this day. Wherefore, excuse me, wherefore Levi hath no part nor inheritance with his brethren, the Lord is his inheritance, according as the Lord thy God promised him. And I stayed in the mount according to the first time forty days and forty nights, and the Lord hearkened unto me at the time also, and the Lord would not destroy thee. So he says here in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 10, And I stayed in the mount according to the first time. The Hebrew says, as the former time, 40 days and 40 nights. I believe, again, Moses is reiterating the second issuance of the Ten Commandments. So we understand, and the, and the scriptures are absolutely replete Moses went 80 days, neither eating nor drinking. How was he sustained? He was sustained by the very presence of God. God has divine supplement. God has divine sustenance for his redeemed. Now, no man, no man in the natural could ever fast 40 days and 40 nights, and then right behind that, or following that, another 40 days and 40 nights without eating or drinking. It's impossible. After 40 days, starvation sets in. Starvation and its process begins to feast on the organs of the body for sustenance. Now, the body would not attack the brain or the heart first, but the body would begin to attack the other elements Let's just use the liver, the pancreas, and this is why we see the emaciated uh, bodies of the little black people in Africa, the children. Their stomachs begin to swell, the, 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 the deformities of the anatomical portions of the body. What's happening? Well, the brain, the heart, is still demanding sustenance, supplement. So then it begins to attack the organs because you've done lost the weight. You're already losing muscle mass. I know I've been there 40 days. As a matter of fact, it took me two years to physically get over a 40-day fast, 40 days on water. Again, I do not tell you these things to be arrogant, to be bigoted, to be self-righteous, like, oh, look at Pastor Langford. I'm sharing with you 
empirical knowledge, empirical knowledge. And I was 30, I was 39 years of age. It took me two years physically. I know what it took out of me in that extended fast. And uh, I understand the process because the body has, a, has an innate desire to live. And so the heart must be sustained. The brain must be sustained. So once the body is virtually depleted, then the body begins to eat. <laughs> it's a poor choice of words, but begins to derive sustenance from the other organs of the body. And, of course, that's why I said starvation sets in. And death proceeds. And I have people, as I said, oh, you're going to hurt yourself. No, you're hurting yourself by your eating. By what you are ingesting, by what you are inducing into your body. You're hurting your body physically. Physically. And of course, I would be derelict. I would be derelict. I would be profusely remiss if I did not tell you this takes discipline. I tell every person who wants to go on an extended fast, you don't wake up on Monday morning and say, I'm going to start a 21-day fast. You don't do that. You might do that for three days. But you have to get yourself prepared mentally and physically to go this parenthetical time in your life if it's an extended fast you get your mind ready people say well you, i can't do that yes you can now i understand those of you who already have physical anomalies physical aberrations uh in your body that you are limited so take one or two days and start trusting god and i tell everyone during their fast Let's just say you, you eat breakfast in 10 minutes and you eat dinner in 15 minutes and you eat supper in 15 minutes. Take that 40 minutes, spend it in prayer every day. Now, my body is totally acclimated and I only eat basically one meal a day. I, I've done this for 40 years. Uh, I refuse uh, to put on weight, to become obese. I just, you know, I, I say to people, there, when, you, when you begin to put on your, your garment, your clothing, men, you put on your pants, ladies, you put on a dress, and things are getting tight, that's not a sign to go buy something larger. No. That's a sign that I need discipline, and I'm going to pull it back. I, I, I weigh most of the time between 203 to 208 pounds. That's, that's my body weight. I have been up to 220, and I have lost all the way down to about 157, 58 on that 40-day fast. And, uh, but my point is, you know you are encroaching, crossing a boundary that you should not be crossing. And it takes discipline to get a hold of your life and refuse to go there. Refuse to go there. As I said in the beginning of this program, fasting has always been a New Testament channel of power as well as the Old Testament. If you can fast, you can do anything. People say, why is it so hard to fast? The reason it is hard to fast is because man fell in disobedience to God through eating something he was not supposed to eat. So the warfare and fasting is, I can't suffer my body to do without. But because that was the vein, that was the door, that was the gate in which man fell, that's why it is so hard 
too fast. But the Bible is full of both men and women who fasted and prayed, who turned the course of history, wherein God sovereignly and divinely intervened, where God manifest himself, where God done so many great things because God himself through his son, Jesus Christ, can understand your infirmity, your weaknesses, and your fragility when you're fasting. I had a lady attack me some time ago, just, just a horrid attack because I quoted uh, Hebrews 2 and 9. And she said, I quoted Psalms chapter 2. But I didn't. That's what she wanted to believe. Excuse me, Psalms chapter 8, verse 5. I did not quote chapter 8, verse 5, but she was adamant to put that verse in my mouth when that's not the verse. The verse in uh, Psalms uh, 8 and 5 is, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and with honor. Well, the apostle Paul quotes that almost word for word, but he interjects something in it. Psalms 8, verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now watch what Paul says in Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Here's the phrase in, 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 uh, uh, superimposed over Psalms 8, 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor, that's exactly what Psalms 8, 5 says. But then this other phrase, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, why do I bring that up? Because in Hebrews 2, 9, you have a synopsis wherein Paul talks about both Christ's deity, majesty, coupled with his humanity. The psalmist only speaks fundamentally of his deity. Now, 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 now David uh, did say, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. That, that speaks of Christ's humanity. Has crowned him with glory and honor speaks of his deity. But Paul goes on to tell us, why he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Angels do not die. Therefore, Christ had to die to atone for man's sins. But here's the secret. Here's the secret. There's so many secrets. Psalms 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. The secret here is this. Christ Humanity relates to our humanity, thus he fully understands man's weakness and man's fragility. Hebrews 4.15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Christ knows everyone's temptation, pain, sorrow, yet he knows it without sin. Now, you can't say that. I can't say that. We all have sinned. I said we all have sinned. I'm not a sinner. I don't live in sin. I hear people say, oh, we're all sinners saved by grace. No, you're not. When you got saved, you put away sin. 
Does that mean I'm perfect? Absolutely not, because you still possess the sin nature. Jesus never had the sin nature. That's why he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. He would not have that nature, thus he could satisfy God's demand for sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here is Christ, who knows nothing about sin, yet he was made sin for us. He knew no sin. Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See? Ecclesiastes 7, 20, There's not a just man. In all the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. I'm not a sinner. I don't live a life of sin. But the propensity, the proclivity, the tendency, yeah, there you go. The tendency is there to sin. Because whoever you obey is who you are servant of. Uh, John 8, 34, he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. Fasting helps you to negate Sin. So many people don't have the power to overcome sin because they never crucify their flesh. I said they never crucify their flesh. The word is abnegate, A-B-N-E-G-A-T-E, abnegate, to deny yourself, to renounce your privileges and your pleasures. You abnegate, you negate your privileges. When you abrogate, you break covenant. But when you abnegate, you are denying yourself. You need to deny your flesh. You ever seen somebody take candy from a baby? Watch the temper tantrum. The child goes ballistic. And of course, today, parents think they're psychologically going to warp their child if they physically discipline them. Those of you who are my age knows what it means to have a belt put on your back inside and get wore out. And that was a great deterrent. That was a great deterrent. Fasting is a great deterrent to help you to say no to sin, to temptation, to Satan, whatever he might try to bring into your life. So many people say, I, I just can't help myself. You heard me say a few minutes ago, that fasting takes discipline. Discipline. That's where we get the word discipleship. Discipleship. So many people today, simply put, just don't have any discipline. But this is where discipline comes in and plays a significant role into your life to help you, to help you to be strong and overcome the enemy. As I said a moment ago, you discipline your kids today, they'll call the social services on you, have you arrested. But good old-fashioned discipline may save your child from hell. You say, well, what do you mean by that? 
Uh, Proverbs 23, 14, thou shalt beat him with, let me, let me back up. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. You see, if you want sometimes to put a pressure on the twig of your child, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. You want to steer that child to a path of righteousness. Now you say, well, that's Old Testament. You beat a child, you deliver his soul from hell, you beat a child, it won't kill him. Well, obviously, both in Old and New Testaments, there is a conveyance, there is a conveyance of discipline. We find that in Hebrews 12 and 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Now watch this. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. And here's the conclusion of that. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. In other words, discipline, chastening, scourging, and a scourging is a beating. Somebody said, well, I, I didn't see that in the Bible. Well, you, there it was. You just didn't recognize the word for what it was. Scourgeth. Scourgeth, as I said, literally means a flogging. You know, when I was growing up, it's called a whipping or a whooping. Now, you get a whooping, you got more than a whipping. Uh, discipline. I see such a lack of that in so many people's lives. I don't say that to be condescending. I don't say that to be demeaning. I don't say, say that to encroach anyone's life. Maybe some of you were raised where your mom, your dad took you with them to the bar. They, you smoked up together. You drank together. You partied together. My children have never seen me smoke a cigarette. They've never seen me curse. They've never seen me get drunk. Never seen me high. I've never taken them to any kind of worldly venue. Why? Because I am their parent. I'm not their friend. That's another problem I see in, in this society, this generation. You can't be the friend of a 20-year-old. You just can't. After you get into the mid-late 20s, you can begin to develop that relationship that's grown from a son, a daughter, into a full-blown man or a woman. I know, I know. Pastor Lankford, you're just too old school. Everything's old school with you. What's well, a fine time to be criticizing me about old school when our world looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket. I read uh, last week where Kelly, the president's right-hand man in the White House, has said to all the staff, 
No more cell phones on working hours. And they all freaked out. Oh, I can't be in touch with my husband. I can't be in touch with my wife. I can't be in touch with my children. Hey, what did people in the White House do in the 70s and 80s? Or for that matter, go back to the turn of the century. What it, it tells me how, how impotent, how insecure people are becoming. Why, I'm going to say something that will make a lot of you mad, but that's all right. If I took your phone away from you, you wouldn't know what to do. I said, you would not know what to do if I took your phone away from you. You would sit right now and twiddle your thumbs hour after hour after hour. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that to attack anyone. Don't, don't think I'm badgering you, beating you down, condescending. I'm just telling you, you've let a little device take control of your life. I have a, I have a phone. Don't take it with me everywhere I go. I don't take it with me to bed. I don't take it with me when we go out to eat. But I was going down a street the other day, downtown, and there were three girls standing there. Instead of talking with each other, they were all on their phone. And how many marriages, listen to me, how many marriages have already been destroyed over a phone, texting, sexting, or whatever the case might be? I Probably eight or nine years ago, we had our county, Gaston County, was declared a, a federal uh, disaster county. But we had a big, big hailstorm. And so they were putting a new roof on my house. And there was probably eight or nine guys there working, tearing off, and other guys were putting back on. And they had a foreman. And we were standing there in the yard, and I, I tried. I started to witness to him about Jesus. And he put his hand up in my face and said, just stop right there, preacher. He said, I know you're a minister. I know you're a man of God. And he said, right now I'm not in the mood to hear anything from a preacher. And he said, I'll tell you why. He said, I picked up my wife's cell phone last night, and I went through it. And there were naked pictures of my pastor on her phone. I said, I fully understand. I'm sorry, and I'll just pray God heal your wounded heart. And I never said another word. And I thought, this is the kind of garbage that's in the church, it's sin, it's wicked, it's vile. And here's a man whom he looked to esteem and regard his pastor as someone he could trust, love, serve, whatever the case might be in any capacity as a deacon or whatever of his church, a presbyter or whatever. And he said, I got naked pictures of my pastor on my wife's phone. Yeah, I was speechless too. Do uh, you reckon that destroyed my ability to witness? Absolutely it did. Let me tell you something. This is the time to pray and to fast. I'm going to be putting up a, a uh, video here real soon, if you've not already seen it. I feel like God has given me some insight in the coming days of this presidency. We need to pray for this man. There is an all out assault and attack on him. And he's trying to turn this nation around. He's trying to get legislation that if you get any kind of public housing, funding, welfare, you need to take a drug test. And some sorry, worthless federal judge says that's overreaching. Why is it people at some workplaces have to take a drug test just to get a job and keep their job, but people out here on the streets that are getting subsidy and welfare 
they can stay high and don't have to prove that they're straight, that they're sober. They are calling evil good and good evil. We may pick this back up tomorrow. I'm not certain right now. But I pray that today I've enlightened your eyes to some degree relative to prayer and fasting. Matter of fact, I, I will pick this back up because I want to show you the plethora of New Testament scriptures relative to fasting. People need to be encouraged to fast. But regretfully, ministers are not encouraging the people to do that. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For it's in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not. Until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Eating and drinking. Put a little discipline in your life. Fast and pray and seek God. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Be strong and be courageous. Truly, this is the only fight worth fighting. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.